back to part two of Manifestation 4. Again, the crew was Mr. Donald Culp. You just wave, Don. Say hi. <laughs> just wave. And Mr. Michael Lewis, who's doing, our fa doing a fabulous teaching here. Then out to the Fruit and Nuts with Chandra out in the West Coast. And back to Brooklyn so that we can go, I can say, back to Mr. Michael. Thank you, Don. And we are going to pick up where we last left Peter off in his exciting adventure with Tabitha. So, to do a healing or miracle, several manifestations come into action. First, the person needs a message of knowledge and or a message of wisdom to know what the situation is and what to do about it. Second, he needs the manifestation of faith to bring to pass the healing or miracle. Third, he must represent Christ on earth via the power of God, bringing to pass the miracle as God supplies the energy for it. And I, we're going to Acts chapter 9, verse 40, to see how a wonderful believer in times past had done these things. Peter sent them all out of the room. I think this is really significant considering uh, what revelation is. God obviously told Peter to get him out of there. There was whatever the purpose was, God knows the hearts of men. The Lord Jesus Christ knows what's up. Uh, so those two beings operating this power outside of that head, our Lord Jesus Christ, is just too many iffies, too many things that we don't understand. But Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees to pray. Communication, this is not like the first time Peter and Jesus had a conversation. <laughs> this was a way of life for him. He's, <laughs> he has been doing this now in Acts chapter 9 for several years. So this is, this is the way that people live in our prayer life, communicating with the Lord and our Father. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. How short and sweet and beautiful God's revelation often is to us. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. Peter spoke the miracle into being. First, Peter prayed. Then he had revelation from the Lord to go ahead. He raised her from the dead by the power of God. Once Peter received the revelation to raise Tabitha, he performed the miracle. He believed that there were... <clears throat> that there would be more miracles and healing in Christ. I mean, we, there would, this would happen more often if people would simply step out in faith and do what the Lord is telling them to do. Now, there's two sides to this. Uh, here we're looking at too often we wait for God to do what he has already given us the spiritual power to do and the revelation to do it. We're just, we won't... We won't activate that faith by trusting him. He's working within us to will and to do of his good pleasure. We have to learn to listen to that still small voice. And that becomes more and more evident as we carnally put on the word in our minds on a day-to-day -day basis, remain faithful in prayer and communications, bearing our heart before the Lord Jesus Christ and our Father God. They'll take care of it, I promise you. It is not our intent to demean the power of prayer in any way. Christians are commanded to pray and should do so as much as possible. However, when God, or the Lord Jesus Christ, gives us revelation to do a healing or miracle, that is not the time to pray. It is the time to step out in our faith and boldly do the miracle. If the miracle or healing takes time, uh, the one receiving the revelation must stay in faith and prayer to see it accomplished, just like we do in our physical realm. As we started this teaching in the last segment, we talked about God didn't invent, all, didn't change all the order of the universe. He is working within the order, accomplishing this wonderful spiritual abilities that we have. And even though 
it, it brings into the realm the powers of God from the heavenlies uh, into manifestation in the physical realm, it still doesn't break the physical laws. People do this carnally all the time. They stick with it. They push through. They come to the mark. We do it carnally all the time with our accomplishments in life. But that is not the manifestation of the Spirit. The manifestation of the Spirit is when we get a message of knowledge and a message of wisdom, and we trust that message and then walk out on the information we've been given to have healings and miracles and prophesy and discern spirits and do all those wonderful power manifestations that God has made available to us. And again, I reiterate, we are not the, <laughs> this is not a new deal. The new deal in this administration is the praise and worship of speaking in tongues and interpretation, which also takes faith. You have to trust God as he fills you and you are seeing all this wonderful information that he's filling you with. The natural response is to want to praise him. And he has made a way for us to bypass all of our carnal understanding in that worship state. And not only that, but in a believer's meeting, when we're around other believers, we can interpret that tongue to manifest that. Of course, we'll get into that in the next segment more. But these all work with the same basic simple principles. And you have that nature inside of you. You have to just start looking at the Word, fellowshipping with like-minded believers, and do it. So you got to stay in faith and prayer to see it accomplished through. Um, Acts chapter 3 says, One day, so not very specific with time here, but this is in the adventures of Peter and John. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. There he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Uh, interesting thing, now this is not the first day this guy's been here, so it says, I think it's beautiful the way Luke illustrates this and what the information it gets us. It says, uh, there he was put every day to beg from those going in and, out, in and out of the temple courts. So Peter and John and those guys in Jerusalem were spending a lot of time around the temple area. That's And around the fellowships, the home fellowships that they were doing. This is very early on in the ministry after the day of Pentecost by its time frame. So this is not the first time they saw this guy. And a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 3, we're still probably dealing with the first couple of years. Jesus Christ probably walked by this guy at the temple gate. Why, at any other time, did this man not receive what he's about to receive here? And I concur with the word and what we've been teaching because they didn't get revelation. They didn't get the green light. God, it wasn't... The, 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 whatever it took for that man's faith, and we're going to see that here, to trust that something was to be received from these people wasn't available until this moment. God and the Lord Jesus Christ knows the hearts of men, and we have to depend on them for that. Now the man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg for the, from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter. He asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Now, this, this look in this fantastic word study, this look and this gaze that they, they gazed upon him, they, they were focused on him. I mean, I can't imagine going past somebody that's hurt that I wouldn't be asking the Lord Lord, is there anything I can do? Is there anything I can, what, what's going on? So they noticed this guy, and they, ga they gazed on him. Peter said, look at us. He gave a command. So this is a man walking by revelation, by a message of knowledge and a message of wisdom from the Lord Jesus Christ or our Father God. And I say that, I've said that several times now. You can't break the two up. The dynamic duo, 
the Lord Jesus Christ is always doing the Father's will. So, I mean, call him up on the uh, hotline, whatever uh, access you have via your spiritual phone, and say, uh, God might say, uh, Jesus is out right now. Can I help you, please? So, I don't know how all that works, but I know that the Lord is always doing the Father's will. So the man gave him, gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. I think this is pertinent. Does it? No, no Jesus thing here, no religious thing. This guy was expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple court, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man. So this is, guys, like I said, he's been around here for a while. The same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. So here we see healing and miracles and the people's attention. It was the perfect time to elevate, to put God's power. And if you read the rest of the, the, rest of the story, you'll see that the probability as far as the people that believed because of that was just off the chart. It was beautiful. That's how God's power works. So, uh, the book of Exodus has great example to show us that it is our choice to use the spiritual power inside of us. God told Moses to take the Israelites out of Egypt. By the time they reached the sea, Pharaoh's army was closing in on their heels, and the people were terrified. They were freaking out down by the sea. In Exodus 14, 13 through 16, in 13 it says, Moses answered the people, Don't be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you this day. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. So he, he's actually, he's, people start praying a lot of times when they already have the information. Now again, going back to what we originally said, I am not trying to demean prayer. I think it should be a part of our everyday, every moment lives with that nature we have. However, once God gives you revelation for something, <laughs> he's going to tell you the same thing he told Moses. The Lord in 14 will fight for you. You need only be still. Well, that wasn't the revelation God gave Moses. God told Moses, if you read the history, to go get him out of there. Gave him power, gave him a little education there uh, at the burning bush. Uh, did a lot of things to convince Moses and to build his faith to show him that he was giving him everything he needed to accomplish the task. And in verse 15, the Lord said unto Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the waters so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. He had all, now God is very gracious here in re retelling Moses, hey dude, I already gave you all the power and authority that you need to do this task, so do it. He's, <laughs> it's very gracious the second time for God to tell us to do something. When we start to listen to him the first time, life really starts to unfold in the power of God. Once God gave the revelation of what to do, it was Moses' turn to act, using the power God had given him. Moses utilized the manifestation of faith to perform the miracle of splitting the Red Sea. Had Moses not had faith to raise his staff and do the miracle, Israel would not have escaped from the Egyptians. Likewise, we as Christians must recognize the power we have and then step out and use that power. <clears throat> Jesus' apostles and disciples had Holy Spirit upon them in John 14, 17, which is why they could, he could send them out to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons, such as recorded in Matthew 10, 8, Luke 10, 9, 
Furthermore, Jesus said that when people have Holy Spirit, they have power. Acts 1.8. It's clear that since every Christian has the gift of Holy Spirit, then every Christian has the power to do the healing and the miracle. Or miracles, healings. Mark 16, 17, and 18, John 14, 12, these are just a few verses. But just as the disciples of Christ and the prophets of old did, we need to increase our faith and step forth boldly to do what the Lord has directed us to do. The manifestation of gifts of healing and the working of miracles are often interwoven. There are certainly miracles that are not healings, <clears throat> such as when Moses parted the Red Sea so that Israel could escape to Egypt. Also, there are healings that are not miracles. <clears throat> then, although the natural power of the body to heal itself uh, is augmented by the healing power of God. In other words, God takes out the cause and boom, the, that the body can naturally heal itself after that. The healing is not instantaneous. However, there are many miracles of healing in the Bible, such as the instantaneous healing of Bartimaeus, who was blind in Mark 10, 46 uh, through 52. Also, the casting out of demons can be a miracle, such as Mark 9, 38 and 39. And I encourage you all, I'm leaving these slides up here, look at the Word. Look at these illustrations. They are pertinent in a believer's life <clears throat> to build your faith. You see it? You say, oh, wow, I can do that too. And then that becomes part of your relationship with the Lord. And as the Lord and our Father sees the confidence in, that you're building as you're growing in faith, He will be faithful to put you in the situation where you can be all you can be, like a Marine for Jesus. Prophecy. The manifestation of prophecy is speaking, writing, or otherwise communicating a message from God to another person or persons. God or the Lord Jesus Christ gives the Christians a message of knowledge or a message of wisdom via the Holy Spirit born inside him. And then he gives that message when that when I give when he, the person receiving it, gives that message to someone else, it is prophecy. The revelation that is spoken as prophecy can come in a moment, coming almost word by word as the speaker says them. Some, some, something we call inspirational prophecy. It can also come as a complete revelation giving to the, given to the speaker before it is spoken as prophecy. This is that relationship building that we're talking about. As you talk to Jesus, he talks back. And it, over time, you progressively learn more and more about situations or about God's word that he wants the body or an individual to hear. Uh, it's just like any other relationship. We, we learn. We grow. Carnally, we do it. We just have to learn to do it spiritually by the revelation that's available from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's in on the act now. It's a really cool deal. Nothing else is nullified. You still have friends and buddies in the body and outside the body, and you just have a new friend named Jesus. And it can come as a combination with some revelation coming beforehand and some coming as prophecy is spoken. As you step out, just like what the guy did, he didn't, Peter said, get up, what we just read, and as he lifted him up, the action, I love to say this, action activates God's power. As he lifted him up, the strength came to him as he believed and as he did what the Word was telling us to do, just like all of us. God does demand faith. He, he demands us to act on our believing. In the Hebrew Scriptures, when a person had Holy Spirit, he or she almost always prophesies. That is why Joel said that when the Holy Spirit would be poured out on, the, on all in the Millennial Kingdom believers, they would prophesy. That's written in Joel 2, 28. And that's why Peter, in his teaching on the day of Pentecost, refers to Joel because of what they saw happening as this first outpouring of 
the gift of Holy Spirit was made available on the Pen day of Pentecost, even though I think it also illustrates that they didn't quite understand what was going, the full measure of what's going on. It was a progressive revelation. It was a relationship thing. So Acts 2.17b and 18, it says, God will pour out, God, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see vision, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. God says his servants will prophesy, so there should be little argument about it. The manifestation of prophecy is to strengthen, encourage, and comfort people. That's in 1 Corinthians 14.3. It, it can reveal secrets of people's hearts so that they can be closer to God. 1 Corinthians 14, 24, and 25. The study of prophecy in the scriptures shows that the prophecy is part of the power of God, which is why God places prophecy in the power group of the manifestations. Some Bible teachers have placed prophecy in worship uh, group of the manifestations, but prophecy is not worship. It is speaking a message from God to people. It is used in a worship service, absolutely yes, but that doesn't make it worship. At any time, at any given time, Christian, in a Christian service, all manifestations may come into play depending on the need of the people or the needs of the people. Many Christians do not prophesy, but it is not because they do not have the spiritual ability. The presence of the Holy Spirit inside a Christian gives him or she, she or he, that ability. If a Christian does not prophesy, either he has not been sufficiently instructed or he does not have the faith to step out on what he has been given or he does not want to prophesy. 1 Corinthians 14.24 states that the whole church can prophesy. <laughs> that should settle it, right? 1 Corinthians 14.36, the King James Version says, Covet to prophesy. Wow. There is something we're supposed to covet. Prophesy. People should be able to hear from God in every believer's meeting. Should be wanting to jump up to the plate, man. Everybody. There is a reason why each Christian should covet to prophesy, bringing God's message to his people. It is not only a tremendous privilege. It is essential for the well-being of the church. A study of the Bible especially the Hebrew scriptures, reveals how valuable prophets were in the spiritual wholeness of the people of Israel. Prophecy is not only speaking about the future. Not only can every Christian prophesy, as the scripture says, but we should want to. Uh, that every believer can prophesy is giving us more conclusive evidence that each believer can manifest all nine manifestations. So, rounding up these group of five, discerning of spirits, the hookie pook one, right? Uh, seeing into the spiritual realm, uh, it, it's, uh, I want to say a few things before we get into this because I think this is probably one of the most misleading ones, not because of a lack of evidence in the word, but because of a lack of accurate display of operation. Uh, discerning, the word discerning is just a, is, is a dividing, a division, a judgment, a, a to be able to distinguish the difference. As you, as a believer, bombard your carnal mind with the Word of God, and as the Lord stays faithful as He always does, and it can it starts giving you revelation to not only understand what's going on around you, but to understand that very word of God that you're going to for your physical joy, for your the pleasure of seeing what our Father and our Lord are all about. As that happens, things start opening up to where you see things from a spiritual or a heavenly perspective. 
which is where you're seated, according to Ephesians. The manifestations of discerning of spirits is necessary if man and women of God are going to deal effectively with spiritual realities of a fallen world. There are many spirits in this world, including angels and gift of Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, because of the spiritual battle that rages around all of us, um, the most important aspect of discerning of spirits is dealing with demonic forces of this world. Now, I this is the first time I'm going to do this. I would question that. Now, this is the book that I've been promoting the whole time, and I'm questioning that as being the most important. I think that without discerning of spirits, you can't tell even the good things that are happening. Uh, a wiser man than me once said, you can see God everywhere, anywhere. You can see God anywhere, or you can miss him everywhere. And I think as we operate this spirit of Christ within us, this spirit, this one new man, this new nature, that we begin to see the spiritual realities of what goes on around us. And even in the Word, we start seeing the differences. Now, true, the, the in Ephesians 6, 12, and the, KG, uh, the King James Version reads, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there are definitely some bad dudes <laughs> that are spirits beings, but there are also some good ones, and we can we can witness those, and we can see those. Peter Peter perceived that it was an angel that broke him out of prison. After it had happened, he perceived it. Well, he wouldn't have had that perception had he not had spirit within him. Our adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking people to devour, according to 1 Peter 5.8. God has not left us helpless, but has empowered us to deal with him. The manifestation of discerning of spirits is more than just recognizing them. It also involves entering into battle against them and casting them out, recognizing demons, protecting the believers, and casting them out is all part of discerning of spirits. The Greek word translated discerning, diakrisis, has several meanings. It can mean a distinguishing or di differentiation. So we see the word divides asunder, right? Well, you are the word. You're living epistles. Also, it can mean to quarrel. <laughs> A lot of believers that like to just sit back and say, oh, I just don't want to fight. Well, that's, <laughs> that doesn't work in this world. Sometimes you, you've got to stand up and show the truth of God when somebody's lying about it. One of the definitions in Liddell and Scott's Greek Lexington is uh, decision by battle, quarrel, dispute. Thus, diakesis can be much more than just discerning. It has an overtone of quarreling or fighting, since discerning of spirits is a total package of recognizing spirits and deals with them. God places it in the power group of the manifestations. I, I, again, uh, I don't want to limit us to uh, what I'm presenting here. I'm, I'm challenging you to go to the Word and see what happened. Uh, the prophets of Baal in the Old Testament, uh, God didn't send a mealy mouth over there. He sent somebody that was ready to operate his power and stand for the true God about the truth. There are people out there that lie about our Father God and his nature uh, from everything from death to, to uh, he causes bad things to happen because you're not doing good. But that's not what the Word says. And that's not what Jesus Christ will reveal to you. The true nature of God is that he is good. He is love. And the manifestation of discerning of spirits helps us, put us in a situation of not only you standing against the evil 
principalities, powers, and mights, and dominions that would lie about that, but also recognizing the good ones that are helping us with the manifestations of miracles and healings that are working around the situation. So the manifestation of discerning of spirits is interwoven with the other manifestations. For example, a believer manifesting discerning of spirits may be simultaneously aware of the presence of demons, knowing what to do about the situation and begin to command it to come out of the person receiving the information about the demon and knowing what to do is similar and interwoven with the message of knowledge and the message of wisdom, while the casting out of the demon can be in the category of a miracle. Uh, as illustrated in Mark 9, 38 and 39. Even as a healing, it can be a miracle, such as what was in Acts 4, 14 and 16. So every Christian will encounter demons, whether he recognizes them or not. Uh, what a great blessing and comfort to know that God has equipped each of us to deal with any demon that comes against us. Ephesians 6, 12, which says we wrestle with demonic powers is written to every Christian. <laughs> Therefore, every Christian can manifest discerning of spirits. In Psalms 34, on the other side, uh, verse 7, it says, The angel of the Lord encamps. I love this. I love this verse. Encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. So the flip side of the coin is we have Good spiritual beings that work for God that love hanging around the Word. So if we're speaking the Word and doing the Word and walking with God, they say, oh boy, look at Don. I want to go hang with him because he is operating the will of God. And as we look at the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, we see also the bearded guy with the headphones on. Who is that? What's your name? What's your name? This is where you talk, Dusty. This is this is where you can like unmute yourself and say your name. <laughs> oh, is that Justin? Dusty, can Dustin. you hear me now? There he oh, is. Oh, yes. that's yes. a good microphone. I just looked up and saw saw a stranger with a black beard, and I didn't know if it was Jesus. So I came around <laughs> talking, or. What, what's no. this? <laughs> Pretty cool. Sorry. Welcome, Dusty. Hello. Anyways, Psalms 34. Uh, the angels like to hang around the Word. And even in the Hebrew Scriptures, as you read them, a lot of the times, angels that were assigned to Israel to protect and fight for them I mean, there's there's revelation in the Hebrew Scriptures where the angel said, hey, as long as you stick with God's Word, I'm with you, dude, but when you leave the Word, I am out of here. Because I like that Scripture. I have to look it up again. I can't remember exactly where it is. Uh, Men travel where angels fear to tread. I don't think that's a compliment. I used to think it was a compliment. Men, no go anywhere. Uh, angels are smarter. The, the, the good angelic beings that operate the power of God and are on God's side, they hang with God and the truth. They were the bearers of the word in the Hebrew scriptures. And they are also ministering spirits to us in this administration. So when we get back, we're going to get into the last two and uh, get on with Corinthians 14, and then have a brief overview in the next segment. But uh, that's all I got for today, Mr. Don. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Michael. That was absolutely terrific. Um, Chandra, you want to close us out with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, open up the green room for anyone who wants to come in. All righty. Hi, Dad. Hi, Heavenly Father. Hey, bro. Hi, Jesus. So we're here together, and it's so awesome to have somebody new joining us. Uh, I hope there was something that that uh, uh, sparked his uh, curiosity or whatnot. Um, 
other than that, I definitely hope that our light shines to all those out there who would like to learn a, a bit of something different that they don't usually hear in those church pews. We are here. We are different. We are here to uh, teach what the Bible actually teaches. And uh, and I do pray that, you know, all those out there who do their best, I do pray to uh, bless them, bless their efforts, bless their hearts. And um and bless us who we're trying to do our best to. We're, we're all human. Uh, I know there's error. Um, so we're not perfect. So just please bless us and, and help us to do our best and um, have wisdom and, and to just spread the truth as much as we possibly can and say the right thing in the right time and the right place. And I know you'll do that for us, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. Well, everybody wave goodbye. And the green room shall be open momentarily. And we'll all be there and you can come in and tell us how good we were or we were idiots, whatever you want. <laughs>